president of Muscatine Community College, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the 2021 Alexander Clark Lecture Series that we've held together with the Alexander Clark Foundation and League of Women Voters of Muscatine County for many, many years. We have a special presentation for you this evening, and our guest is David Conan, whom I will introduce to you in just a moment. Uh, I know that we have several community members and uh, my colleagues at MCC on this uh, conversation tonight. And I do want to um, thank Mayor Diana Broderson for her declaration of Alexander Clark Day. Um, today is Alexander Clark's birthday. And I would just like to read the resolution that the mayor made at a recent city council meeting. Whereas Alexander G. Clark's birthday was established as Alexander Clark Day in perpetuity by unanimous vote of the city council in 2018, and whereas the city of Muscatine then pledged that after long obscurity and 60 years of on and off observance, our renowned resident should be honored and remembered by his hometown perpetually and whereas the year 2021 is the 130th anniversary of Clark's death while he was serving in Liberia as Minister Resident and Consul General of the United States. And whereas the Muscatine Community School District recently dedicated the renamed Susan Clark Junior High School in recognition of the Clark family's role in winning equal rights for all public school students. And whereas the 2021 Alexander Clark Lecture at Muscatine Community College titled Josiah Bushnell Grinnell and the Underground Railroad will be delivered by historian and author David Conan on February 25, Clark's 195th birthday. Now, therefore, I, Diana L. Broderson, Mayor of the City of Muscatine, Iowa, do hereby proclaim Thursday, February 25, 2021, to be observed as Alexander Clark Day. And that was the resolution made on the 18th day of February um, by our Mayor, Diana Broderson. Thank you, Mayor Broderson. And now to the introduction of tonight's speaker. David Conan is an independent researcher and writer. He stumbled on to Confederates from Iowa while researching the Iowa Underground Railroad. During the season, he works as a historical interpreter at Living History Farms. A great, great grandson of two Union veterans, his blog is Confederates from Iowa not to defend, but to understand. David Conan spent nearly two decades researching dissenters in Iowa, Grinnell residents who helped on the Underground Railroad and their polar opposites, Iowa Confederates. This research culminated in Iowa Confederates in the Civil War, a book uh, available on uh, various sites. He is listed on the Humanities Iowa Speakers Bureau. Conan is also a member of Sons of Union Veterans and of the Des Moines Civil War Roundtable. He has been to Muscatine before, I'm told, as a guest uh, of the Musser Public Library, and uh, he lives in Earlham. And I'm uh, very delighted to have the opportunity to present um, to the Muscatine community David Conan. Um, thank you. Thank you, Naomi and, and Jeremy. Thank you so much, everyone, for this honor of, of allowing me to speak tonight for this occasion, for this lecture series. Um, I'm going to hit share screen. Yep. And Dave, while you do that, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention. Um, there, we are going to allow Dave to go through his presentation, um, but encourage you to ask questions or make your comments in the Q&A, and we will be sure to leave time for a conversation um, towards the end. 
All right, very good. On the screen, you'll see a map of Iowa. This shows the main route for the Underground Railroad, which basically follows the route of Interstate 80 today going across the state. You'll notice arrows coming up from Missouri representing smaller tributaries to the main route of the Underground Railroad. From time to time, you're going to see me turn my head to the side to look at my notes. That's what's going on. So with no further ado, let's begin. Preacher, Congressman, Negro Stealer. Josiah Bushnell Grinnell was called all of these things during his lifetime. The third moniker, Negro Stealer, came from participating in the Iowa Underground Railroad. J.B. Grinnell had help from many Grinnell residents, most of whom belonged to the Grinnell Congregational Church. At least 37 fugitive slaves passed through Grinnell on the Underground Railroad from Grinnell's founding in 1854 through 1860. These cases are documented. Less well-documented cases could push the number even higher. Iowa was, for the most part, a racist state before and during the Civil War. This is what I mean. Belief in white superiority was the rule. J.B. Grinnell was an exception. He believed that all people are made in the image of God and as such are valuable and deserve respect. He also believed that all people should have equal rights. Such beliefs were considered radical and even dangerous before the Civil War. Josiah Bushnell Grinnell was born in Vermont in 1821. His father died when J.B. was 10. At a young age, J.B. worked hard and earned the trust of adults. J.B., oops. Baby attended, he attended the Oneida Academy, a place designed to train men to preach the gospel. The Oneida Academy emphasized abolition and temperance. JB became a congregational minister. He served a church in New York State. The Reverend JB Grinnell preached about the Bible, heaven, hell, and the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. For example, in 1847, J.B. Grinnell asked in a sermon, why is it hard to believe that God can raise the dead? He was a conscientious minister. On January 17, 1850, after writing a sermon, he wrote in his diary, today have done little, read newspapers too much, all oh, for a spiritual mind, sleep too much, do not pray enough. Two months later, on April 1st, J.B. Grinnell performed the wedding of an African-American couple. Later that year, Congress passed the Fugitive Slave Act. Under this act, federal marshals were able to force bystanders to help deliver slaves to their masters. This meant that abolition-minded citizens could be coerced into violating their consciences. To help a fugitive slave escape or avoid arrest could result in a huge penalty, up to a thousand dollar fine and up to six months in jail. An early resident of Grinnell, Jesse Macy, said the Fugitive Slave Act was one of the most barbarous pieces of legislation for enacted by a civilized country. Sometime after the Fugitive Slave Act was passed, J.B. Grinnell tried to start a congregational church in Washington, D.C. He is credited with preaching a controversial anti-slavery sermon right in our nation's capital. During this period, he courted and married, married Julia Chapin. This is a picture of Julia later in life. Shortly afterwards, JB took one of the frequent trips. He was known throughout his life for taking trips. He wrote his bride, commending you, my dear, to him who is our constant friend. I am your loving and affectionate husband. J.B. might have kept preaching in New York, but he developed a hoarse throat. With sadness, he left the pulpit. He reports visiting Horace Greeley, famous editor and publisher of the New York Tribune, asking for advice. J.B. already knew Greeley by serving as a freelance reporter for the Tribune. Have you heard the expression, go west, young man? That's what Greeley told J.B. 
but he told it to other people too. Greeley mentioned that he needed a freelance reporter uh, to report on the Illinois Agricultural Fair. JB accepted this assignment, but he left for Illinois with a dream, a dream of starting a colony of like-minded folks out West. That's what, that's what, what Illinois and Iowa were considered back then, out West. After the agricultural fair, he looked into starting a settlement in Missouri where his wife, Julia, had inherited land. But JB changed his mind when he learned that the neighborhood was strongly pro-slavery. Pro As a colleague of mine said, serendipity was his best friend. JB boarded a train in Illinois heading east where he met two slave hunters and on their way to return a fugitive slave. The slave hunters loudly cursed the North as made up of cowards and nigger thieves. JB stood up and said he opposed slavery and the men threatened him. An elderly passenger watched this unfolding. He feared for JB's safety. After the slave hunters had departed, he introduced himself as Henry Farnham, man who financed the Rock Island Railroad. Farnham praised JB for standing his ground and suggested that he, that he move to Iowa, where Farnham was planning to build a railroad clear across the state. Farnham implied that a colony could be built near the rail line, and he told JB who to contact about the projected route of the railroad. JB's dream, shadowy at first, was starting to take form. He could start a colony and preach in Iowa as long as his throat held out. He quickly placed a notice in two New York papers calling for settlers of congenial, moral, and religious sentiments. But the settlers needed to have enough money to make the school and the church attractive and paramount institutions from the outset. Three men read those words and joined, met JB in Iowa. They were Henry Hamilton, the Reverend Homer Hamlin, and Dr. Thomas Holyoke. Those men and a handful of other settlers hewed out a colony on the prairie. Their wives stayed back east. JB wrote Julia that he hoped he was laying foundations for a good colony and for us a home. Eventually, the wives and children arrived. Most of the settlers lived moral lives and wanted to educate their children. They also opposed slavery, drinking, and the sale of liquor. An early settler and her husband arrived in the Grinnell colony on a hot summer day. They crawled inside their wagon and slept away the afternoon. They were awakened by singing. She had never heard music so sweet. She learned that the men had come in from their work and were having worship after supper. She said to her husband, if we have got into a place where they will sing and pray when they are so tired, I think we've got in the right place. The couple started attending Thursday evening prayer meetings. She later recalled, I know they did much to help us to bear the trials and perplexities of our pioneer life. The Grinnell Congregational Church was the first church in town and it was closely linked to the early history of Grinnell. Not everyone belonged to the Congregational Church but its members uh, cooperated with other Protestant churches. On the national scene, Stephen, US, U.S. Senator Stephen A. Douglas promoted popular sovereignty in the Kansas and Nebraska territories. This allowed settlers to determine whether the new state would be slave or free. Pro-slavery settlers, especially from Missouri, and abolitionist settlers, many from New England, poured into Kansas. The territory was a tinderbox. Pro-slavery men looted the town of Lawrence, and John Brown vengefully killed five pro-slavery settlers at Osawatomie. The conflict ramped up. The troubles in Kansas seemed very close to Gr the Grinnell residents. Leonard F. Parker stated, slavery and anti-slavery filled the air, and John Brown was arousing every man to thought and action. Literate Grinnell residents, both men and women, read the national and local newspapers, and discussed slavery and Kansas in a lyceum. Now, a lyceum was a public meeting, kind of like what we're doing now, but in this case, 
everybody met in person together. The State Congregational Association of Ministers met in Grinnell in summer of 1856, and they discussed slavery and especially Kansas. They expressed indignation over the outrages that have been inflicted upon our fellow citizens of Kansas by hordes of armed men from Missouri for the purpose of crushing out liberty. Shortly afterwards, J.B. began campaigning for the Iowa State Senate. He served three terms in Iowa City. During J.B.'s first year of service in 1857, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that Dred Scott, a slave, wasn't a U.S. citizen and that Congress couldn't prohibit slavery in the territories. Later that year, the State Congregational Association declared that the Dred Scott decision is contrary to the word of God and is the moral and civil assassination of the colored race who have rights that we should respect and maintain. The congregational ministers advised all humane and Christian men to disregard its requirements. The next year, Kansas and the slavery question came home to Grinnell in a very personal way. 16-year-old Frances Overton was a slave in Missouri whose master apparently took her with him to Kansas. She escaped and made her way along the Underground Railroad to Grinnell in late 1858. She was fortunate to be in Grinnell. During Frances' stay there, J.B. Grinnell declared in a letter to the editor of the Iowa Statesman in Des Moines that runaway slaves were apt to be fed and warmed here. Now that was very risky for JB to say and bold. He was saying publicly, yep, we will help fugitive slaves. Even better for Francis, the large Grinnell Congregational Church required members to oppose slavery. Members also agreed to respect the rights and privileges of others, regardless of natural educational and social differences. They loved to emphasize the biblical text, quoting Jesus, inasmuch as ye have done it to the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Best of all, Francis found a home with Amos and Augusta Bixby. Amos was a lawyer and an early girl settler. His law practice was very modest, so he farmed on the side, and Augusta worked as a housewife. The congregational church had met in their home in the early days. Francis couldn't read or write, so Augusta homeschooled her, besides caring for her own two young children. Francis was treated as a family member who shared in responsibilities and helped with household chores. Augusta learned that Francis didn't know that the earth is round. She also lacked religious knowledge. For example, when Francis saw a picture of Jesus Christ on a cross, she asked, what are they doing to that man up there? but she also had distorted religious knowledge. Over time, Francis confided to Augusta that her master's sons had sexually abused her. Years later, Amos reflected that hers was but the unhappy lot of slave girls since the world began. A few Grinnell residents thought it was wrong for Francis to live with the Bixby's. The dissatisfaction of a few increased after the Bixby's began taking Francis to Sunday school. Three months later, Francis won a prize for memorizing the most scripture. Amos later recalled, this caused offense to some white competitors. More controversy came to Grinnell a few months later. Abolitionist John Brown and his party rolled into town bristling with weapons. It was an unusually warm Saturday in February. The roads were muddy with the blackest, stickiest substance one can imagine, so adhesive that men used to carry wooden paddles in their pockets to scrape it off with. Brown knocked on J.B. Grinnell's door, saying he was a friend of Julia Chapin Grinnell's father. Brown stated, I'm not here for a social visit. I am the awful Brown of whom you have heard, Captain John Brown of Kansas. Brown sought shelter for two nights, so he wouldn't have to travel on the Sabbath. Grinnell found housing for Brown, 12 fugitive slaves, and other armed men. Some stayed in the parlor of Grinnell's home, nicknamed Liberty Room. 
Some stayed in his sheep barn, others in a local hotel. Curious people poured in from the countryside to see Brown's party, and JB invited him to speak that night. The room was packed on the second floor of the Grinnell School, a room used for congregational church services on Sunday mornings. For two evenings in a row, John Brown and his military aide, John Caggy, spoke to cheering crowds. The second night, three congregational ministers, including J.B. Grinnell, asked God to bless Brown. They urged the listeners to give contributions to Brown. One of them also asked God to forgive Brown of any wrongs that he may have committed. Brown objected, saying he didn't ask forgiveness for anything he had done. J.B. Grinnell thanked Almighty God in behalf of the whole company for his love, or rather his great mercy and protecting care. Some in the crowd were upset. One was Nathaniel W. Clark, father-in-law of Grinnell co-founder, Dr. Thomas Holyoke. Clark, this is his tombstone later on. You'll see the, the anchor on that, on that tombstone indicating his status as a sea captain. So Clark had been a, a sea captain who had followed his daughter and Dr. Holyoke to Grinnell. Captain Clark knew that John Brown's men had killed a Missouri slave owner and brought runaway slaves with them. Captain Clark saw those slaves as property. Therefore, he thought John Brown was a murderer and a Negro stealer. Captain Clark resented J.B. Grinnell for honoring Brown. The next morning, John Brown and company stopped their wagons in front of the schoolhouse. Brown asked to speak with Leonard F. Parker, the superintendent and future historian of Powashi County. Joanna Harris Ames was one of the school children who scurried out and gathered around Brown, who sat in the driver's seat of a wagon. She later wrote that some irrepressible pickaninnies pushed up the wagon cover and smiled. Before the party rode off to the Quaker settlement at Springdale, well-wishers pushed cakes into their hands. In the following days, J.B. Grinnell worked with William Penn Clark, me, worked with William Penn Clark to arrange for John Brown and company to have a free and safe conveyance to Chicago. Not long afterwards, some Iowa newspapers praised J.B. for welcoming Brown Others criticized J.B. for letting John Brown speak in a church. One wag twisted J.B.'s name, calling him John Brown Grinnell. Decades later, Leonard F. Parker predicted, in the years to come, it may seem remarkable that men stained with blood and planning to take still other lives were admitted with arms in their pockets to this church in February 1859. The town of Grinnell did sympathize with Brown, but it was an honor for him as a friend of an outraged Kansas rather than as an emancipator of Virginia or Missouri slaves. In summer of 1859, the fugitive slaves who had been with Brown were safe in Canada. In October, Brown's party at attacked the Federal Armory at Harper's Ferry, Virginia, hoping to start a slave rebellion. Instead, Brown was captured, tried, and hanged for treason against the state of Virginia. The hanging came on December 2nd, 1859, just nine months after his appearance in Grinnell. Around this time, Amos Bixby decided to send Francis Overton to Grinnell School. He asked J.B. Grinnell's opinion. J.B. asserted, send her to school. And if anyone dare oppose her, he can't stay in the town 24 hours any more than if he had committed a rape. But J.B. underestimated Captain Clark and his like-minded friends. Francis flourished at Grinnell School, according to Augusta Bixby, and, and, uh, and Francis learned very fast. Unfortunately for Francis, Captain Clark didn't want his children to attend school on terms of equality with fugitive Negroes. Therefore, Captain Clark contacted Francis's master in Missouri and a slave hunter who had stopped near Grinnell. The slave hunter had tracked down two female slaves from Nebraska all the way to East Central Iowa. Captain Clark reportedly told him that a nice piece of property known as Francis 
is unlawfully harbored in Grinnell. The Bixbys were frightened. Amos later wrote, under the fugitive slave law, the penalties for aiding or for harboring fugitive slaves were so severe that one might well dread them. You see, Amos Bixby was struggling financially in the lingering panic of 1857. He eked out a living, but he couldn't repay his debts, even to his own father, not to mention other people. His reputation as an honest man was at risk. In these circumstances, a $1,000 fine would have been disastrous. But Amos and Augusta still sheltered Francis, likely because they cared for her as a person and they loved Jesus. Francis turned their garret, a room just underneath the roof, into a fortress. She reached it through a small hole in the ceiling where she could pull the ladder up after her. Francis kept weapons in the garret. Amos later wrote, if the slave hunters came, she could keep them at bay until the abolition town was aroused. We depended on men such as Harvey Bliss to rescue her. Bliss was the town grocer who rode his wagon regularly to Iowa City. On at least one occasion, he carried a fugitive slave. Finally, the danger was so imminent that Amos asked school superintendent Leonard F. Parker to get Francis out of town. Parker also belonged to the Grinnell, Grinnell Congregational Church. That evening, between sunset and sunrise, someone drove a team northward carrying Francis. They intended for Francis to find a home among the Quakers in Hardin County. She only made it as far as Timber Creek in Marshall County. On February 1st, 1860, Augusta Bixby grieved. My poor black girl is gone. Francis departed Grinnell as just as the town was in the midst of a religious revival that had started several weeks earlier. Local ministers, including J.B. Grinnell, held afternoon and evening religious meetings Monday through Friday. Leonard F. Parker's wife, Sarah, wrote to her mother, our meetings are over, but the town is much changed. Captain Clark seems converted, and many of our most hardened ones are praying now. During the revival, a Quaker man brought four large male fugitives in their early 20s to Grinnell from Tabor in far southwest Iowa. Grinnell residents offered them work. Sarah Parker explained, two of them wished to go back to Missouri after their wives and children. They were anxious to learn and asked to go to school. Their employers agreed until the spring war came on. The fugitive slaves reasoned that they could better rescue their families if they could read guideposts and friendly written directions. L.F. Parker, the superintendent, called the foreman docile and patient. You see, they entered the lowest grade and Edna Marsh Buck was their teacher. The children were light, according to Parker, were delighted with their woolly hair, curious pronunciation, and jolly good nature. But their presence offended many. Captain Clark, who had daughters in school, was one who objected strongly. On Sunday, March 11th, 66 people joined the Grinnell Congregational Church. 62 of the new members professed faith in Jesus Christ as Savior. JB seemingly was out of town for this event. The following day was the annual Grinnell School Meeting. It was usually just a routine event, but this year, Captain Clark, plotted with like-minded men to eject four male intruders. L.F. Parker later said the men had hoped to outwit the abolitionists and make sad Caucasians happy evermore. When the meeting began, Captain Clark and his supporters moved to exclude non-residents from the school. L.F. Parker responded, remember he was the superintendent, he responded that the district would lose money, lots of tuition money. The motion was defeated. The dissenter, dissenters forced another vote. Shall colored pupils be received in our schools? It passed by a small majority. One frenzied man said, they shall never enter those doors unless over my dead body. Some residents verbally attacked Ella and Sarah Parker, both Oberlin College graduates, considered radicals. 
one resident slandered Sarah Parker and another Oberlin alumna, Jane Cooper, with sexual innuendo. Augusta Bixby stood up for the Oberlin graduates and the meeting adjourned. Determined men on both sides expected trouble at school the next day. L.F. Parker arrived early Tuesday carrying a black thorn walking stick. Captain Clark holding a very large cane and Samuel Scotch Cooper and told the elementary teacher Edna Marsh Buck that they would drive the fugitive slaves from her classroom. She went upstairs and found Parker. He flew down the stairs and confronted the men. Captain Clark and Cooper demanded that the fugitives be kept out of school. Parker said he would defend any student who was entitled to attend. They threatened him saying, we know where to find you and left. Captain Clark and Cooper rejoined a mob that had formed just outside the school. A block away, two of the African-American students saw the mob with clubs and it is supposed concealed weapons. Anti-slavery men joined the black students and armed them with revolvers. One of the students climbed upon a pile of lumber and made a passionate speech. He said that if they must suffer so to gain their freedom after they had gained it, I'm sorry, excuse me. He said that if they must suffer so to gain their freedom and have all these indignities heaped upon them after they had gained it, they might as well die at once. The fugitive slaves then started across the churchyard toward the schoolhouse. Anti-slavery men persuaded the fugitives to turn back, although they preferred to fight their way through the mob and enter the school. Mob members called on anti-slavery men to disarm the fugitives, but they would not, for the fugitives' lives had been threatened and they would not deprive them of the means of defense. Riot ran wild in the streets until noon. A short calm followed. Both sides discussed what to do next, with mob members loudly denouncing L.F. Parker and the fugitives. Wednesday morning was as exciting as Tuesday. Sarah Parker wrote her mother, desperate deeds were meditated. Men maddened with hate and rage ran through the streets with insulting words ever on their lips. She feared that her husband might be injured or killed. But we all live. Though knives were wetted for hand-to-hand -hand encounters, guns loaded, and pistols made ready. Sarah Parker later wrote, the town is not settled yet. It will probably divide the congregational church, for several members were in the mob. The school closed, is to commence in three weeks. School directors buckled under, and they changed the rules. They referred to the fugitive slaves as foreign students and required them to pay half of the tuition in advance. This prevented them from returning to school. Amos Bixby's aunt, Sarah H. Bixby, dissented against the board's action. So she opened up her home as a private school for all colored students in town. Sarah Parker contemplated the revival that had preceded the riot. She quoted scripture. When the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, Satan came also among them. So it has been here. The fugitive slaves lingered a while in Grinnell, working summer jobs on farms and attending Sarah Bixby's school. One of them stayed with Homer Hamlin and his family, and then they left town. Captain Clark may have succeeded in driving the fugitive slaves out of the public school, but he suffered a personal loss. His five-month-old grandson died shortly after the riot. The baby had been named after him. Captain Clark re-entered the fray less than three months later when more fugitive slaves arrived in Grinnell. He alerted newspapers in Iowa and St. Louis of this fact. On July 14, 1860, J.B. Grinnell wrote a note to William Penn Clark that he had sent forward five fugitive slaves, three women and two children to neighboring Brooklyn. J.B. had learned that there was a reward of $1,000 offered for them at Nebraska City. About a month later, on August 13th, three wagons carrying 15 fugitive slaves arrived in Grinnell. Captain Clark 
sent a detailed hostile letter to the Iowa State Journal. He wrote that a grand abolition rally was got up at the schoolhouse to receive them. Captain Clark stated, J.B. Grinnell introduced them who, he said, were Southern gentlemen traveling north for the benefit of their health as was customary at this season of the year. And as they were rather short of funds, he called for a contribution. Three days later, a writer for the Iowa State Journal claimed to have seen the three wagons full of fugitive slaves within 10 miles of Iowa City. Ryder claimed that Ennis Bixby, then a Republican candidate for county office, was chaperone of the wagons. Now, Captain Clark's original letter, noting the three wagons of fugitive slaves, had triggered a flurry of responses from J.B. Grinnell's supporters, including Captain Clark's very own son-in-law, Dr. Thomas Holyoke. Captain Clark sent a heated response to Dr. Holyoke's letter. In that letter, Captain Clark gave specific details about Francis Overton and the four male fugitive slaves. Using a broad brush, Captain Clark stated, as far as the town of Grinnell is concerned, it has a widespread reputation of being the most notorious rendezvous for stolen and fugitive Negroes west of the Mississippi. Many of them are ultra abolitionists. Amos Bixby and S.J. Cooper, are two of them, and all the ink that T. Holyoke ever put on paper can't blot it out. Captain Clark fired off a final letter on October 12th, 1860. He wrote the journal editor that one of the four fugitive slaves had returned to call on Reverend Homer Hamlin. With the start of the Civil War, Captain Clark stopped his letter writing campaign. However, his relationship with his son-in-law, Dr. Holyoke, deteriorated. The state of Iowa charged Captain Clark with maliciously setting on fire a stack of wheat belonging to Dr. Holyoke. Dr. Holyoke testified that he had lived, had, that his father-in-law had feelings of the most malignant hatred and enmity toward him and had made many threats. Dr. Holyoke said he had lived in continual fear of his father-in-law for a long time. The following year, 1863, Dr. Holyoke accused Captain Clark of sticking a pitchfork into his horse. That same year, J.B. Grinnell was elected to Congress. He introduced a resolution encouraging African Americans to enlist in the Union Army. The resolution passed. Afterwards, President Lincoln invited Grinnell to his office and said, it's a great day for the black man when you tell him that he shall carry a gun. It foretells that he is to have the full enjoyment of his liberty and manhood. Lincoln concluded, now tell your people in Iowa, the time has come when I am for everybody fighting the rebels. Let Indians fight them, let the Negroes fight them. And if you've got any strong-legged jackasses that can kick, uh, kick the rebels to death, they have my hearty consent. On another occasion, J.B. complained to Lincoln about dealing with Democrats in Congress. The president said, young man, now, Grinnell was in his early 40s. Forget your annoyances. They are only as flea bites compared to mine. They are serious comedy, while I am in the focus of tragedy and fire. Debates on the floor of the House of Representatives sometimes became emotional, and J.B. sometimes made scathing remarks. After all, he was only human. Biographer Charles E. Payne notes that sometimes J.B. would accuse Democrats of being in league with slavery and the devil. After the Confederate surrender at Appomattox, Abraham Lincoln's days were coming to an end. J.B. was back in Grinnell on a Sunday morning, standing on his pastor's porch when he heard that Lincoln was dead. He later recalled, our grief was beyond expression. For the first time in my life, I fainted. After the Civil War ended, J.B. remained in Congress for a couple of years. Historian Payne observes, Grinnell's uncompromising attitude on Negro rights made him many bitter enemies in the House who lost no opportunity to attack him. On one occasion, during a lull in the debate, a member from Kentucky rose and proposed that to relieve the tediousness of the hour, our pastoral brother from Iowa be invited to sing an abolition song. Quick as a flash, Grinnell was on his feet with a retort. I'm not a good singer myself, but I'll propose a verse from Isaac Watts 
and request the member from Kentucky to do the singing. Grinnell then repeated, and are we rebels still alive? And dare we yet rebel? And is it not amazing grace that we are out of hell? The response brought down the house and Grinnell was never again asked to sing. During his service as an Iowa State Senator and as a Congressman, JB nearly always voted in favor of measures to help educate, empower, and equip African-Americans. On two occasions, it's true that he voted against those measures as a matter of political expediency, of timing, but not as a matter of principle. In 1890, near the end of his life, JB gave credit to God for driving him forth from his Eastern home. JB said he had hoped to elevate man and promote the cause of Christ. One of his favorite hymns had these words. <clears throat> A charge to keep I have, a God to glorify, a never-dying soul to save and fit it for the sky. To serve the present age, my calling to fulfill. Oh, may it all my powers engage to do my master's will. In reflecting on JB's life, it's possible to discern reasons for his exemplary beliefs and actions. Several factors seem apparent. One, he probably was a well-adjusted person who, as a child, knew he was loved. Two, he trusted Jesus Christ as his savior and he believed he was forgiven. Three, he embraced the teachings of the Oneida Academy that slavery should be abolished and all people deserve respect. Four, he was surrounded and assisted by many like-minded people in Grinnell, including his wife, Julia. A final word on the March 1860 riot. It had taken time, as you can imagine, for the Grinnell Congregational Church to recover from the divisive effects of the riot. A petition actually went around the church, criticizing members who had opposed having fugitive slaves in school. The petition was dropped, but some years later, one erring member cheered a colored graduate of Iowa College, now Grinnell College. Other dissenters supported every radical step in favor of Negroes. I think the JB would have approved. Thank you very much. Do you have any, any questions or comments that you might like to share? Dave, I know Jeremy is uh, monitoring the Q&A for us, um, okay. and it, it, your presentation was so compelling. I would, I would be surprised that people had time to ask their questions or make comments while you were speaking. So, sure. Um, I did notice that we have several um, very uh, honored guests uh, joining us for our presentation, including the mayor Diana Broderson, whose declaration okay. I read when we began. Great. Uh, several members of the Alexander Clark Foundation and the League of Women Voters of Muscatine County. Wow. And uh, cool. also uh, an author you may know, um, Rochelle Chase, who we hosted at Muscatine several years ago. She wrote a book called Lost Buxton. I'm glad oh, to wow. see her uh, joining us too. Yeah. Oh, wow, great. Yep. Wow. Um, Buxton has, as quite a quite a history we got yeah. a few questions here for you uh dan clark asks have you studied grinnell's part in moving iowa college to grinnell and uh, and and alden b robbins uh, muscatine's congregational pastor was the iowa college president oh he was in davenport 
Um, you're, you're saying Reverend Roberts was uh, was president when it was in Davenport? Yes. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yes, I had read about it. Um, the fortunes of the college had had um, really diminished at, at the moment that that um, that the college up and moved from Davenport. I remember reading that um, they fit the belongings of the college basically on one wagon, some scientific equipment, some books, and off they went uh, to, to Grinnell, to young Grinnell. Angelique, a colleague of ours at Eastern Iowa, asks about what do you think of the conversation uh, on diversity today? And uh, is there enough of a call to action? Wow, that is a great question. I don't think that I am really equipped to, to address that. I spent six years studying uh, the story that I shared with you tonight. It took me that long to try to figure out who participated in, in the riot, who, who, uh, who triggered the riot and, and what happened. It was just amazing to me that the riot had ever occurred and it, I, I just focused so much on, on that. And in general, my, my approach to history is that um, I, think, uh, I think I'm better served and historians generally are better served in, in examining the past and offering perspectives, trying to add, uh, look at things in context. And if, if people want to try to um, see some parallels with today, they're welcome to do it, but I don't really feel comfortable um, offering those, those parallels myself. Does that, does that make any sense? Yeah, and then there's another question. I'm not sure if I'm gonna pronounce the last name correct, but Dr. Uh, Hol Holyoke, uh, is he connected with Mount Holyoke College in Massachusetts? It's a great question. I was not able to find any, any relational connection between Dr. Holyoke and the college. That's a great question. Um, I was looking for that and I just couldn't, I couldn't establish that. Another question from Sandy, is the Grinnell Homestead and Congregational Church still in Grinnell? Um, no, that's, that's a great question. It was in the 60s, I believe, that um, uh, somebody tore down J.B. Grinnell's home, including the Liberty Room, and I imagine that, at least in retrospect, uh, historians cried. Um, the Congregational Church had the congregational church that exists right now is probably 50 or 100 yards away from the location of, of the one that we showed the picture of that was this also the schoolhouse. Um, and that had been torn down well over 100 years ago, I'd say. And so um, in a, a wider sense, there are no buildings at all left in Grinnell that were actually existing during um, during the time of the Underground Railroad. Although there are rumors that persist, it's a great story and um, the rumors have a very long life. So at this point, that answers all the questions that are in the chat. Until Dan Clark just dropped one in, let me review it here quick and see if I can get the gist. Um, one of the major routes into the Muscatine area was through Iowa City, where prominent citizens such as Dr. Jesse Bowen and William Penn Clark were key players. Mm -hmm. Clark and Josiah Grinnell, for whom the city of Grinnell and Grinnell College are named, arranged for the boxcar to be delivered to West Liberty that would transport John Brown and his followers there on their final leg out of Iowa in 1858 towards their ill-fated 1859 raid in Harper's Ferry, West Virginia. Mm -hmm. That's from the Muscatine Journal reported by jo uh, Charles Potter. Yeah, yeah. Um, it seems that that was a pretty, a, a pretty slick move of arranging, arranging that seamless transportation. Um, yeah. And Dave, we you you talked about um, you know none of the historical buildings still being um, being available. 
Um, I should mention that the Alexander Clark House uh, is still standing in, in Muscatine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I remember one time um, Dan Clark and his wife kindly drove me by. Just just let me step out of the car and just take a look at, at, uh, at the site. They were very kind. So another question from Sandy. Um, they're asking more, can you speak uh, to the expectations of service that Grinnell College students do? Oh, that's a great question. No, I can't. Um, I just, I, I think they have a reputation of a service requirement, but I will say this. Um, um, when Grinnell College was founded, it was founded by, um, Basically, it was founded by, had to start with the Iowa Band. They were a group of, of um, congregational ministers and missionaries from the Northeast who wanted to evangelize in Iowa, and they wanted a school there. And at the meeting that was meant to dedicate this, this, this new school, there was a prayer that Grinnell College would be a light to the nations. Now, that's very biblical terminology. And I think that they meant that in largely a spiritual sense, a biblical sense, but isn't it interesting that today, um, Grinnell College, through many acts of service and, and through the good deeds of, and, and uh, inventions of many of its graduates has blessed the nations. It has been in a sense, a light to the nations. Thank you, and that's all the questions that are in the uh, boxes at this point in time, in the chat and in the Q&A. Well, I can stay as long as you'd like, but uh, I wanna thank you all for this opportunity to share this story tonight, and um, hope you all have a good night. Two more questions have just popped up if you're okay answering those. So, oh, sure, of course. Uh, Muscatine's Pastor Robbins was one of the Iowa band missionaries. It's a comment yes. that's there. Maybe you can talk a little bit more about that. Um, well, the Iowa band, um, some of these members of the Iowa band, I don't know so much about, about Reverend Robbins, but others, they had, many of them had quite long lives and they, many of them served churches for, for decades and have voluminous uh, correspondence that still is in the archives, Grinnell College archives in the Iowa room. It's, uh, it's wonderful. And if a person would like to dig deeper, even to possibly, possibly Reverend Robbins's correspondence is in there. Um, <laughs> It's a rich resource. And um, in, that reminds me, uh, some of the, some of the um, there's a diary of the pastor who was a member of the Iowa band, I believe, the congregational pastor in Burlington, his diary I found at the State Historical Archives in Des Moines. And this diary includes, uh, it runs through the Civil War. It's fascinating. Just it, it includes a death of at least one child and his heartache and trying to trying to soldier on through his grief and offer some kind of solace and, and, and pastoral care to other people in that situation. It was really a, a touching diary to read. And then I'll close with one last question from Krista, Iowa State Extension. Uh, when Grinnell first came to Iowa, were there Native Americans still living on their land? And if so, what was his relationship with them? Okay. Um, there, are, there are reports from early Grinnell that sometimes settlers would see, would see um, Native Americans looking towards them and then moving on, being described as having kind of a a homesick look or, or, or something that, that they were in the process of being forced out. And um, uh, with regards to J.B. Grinnell's relationship with these Native Americans, here's the only thing that I know, and this impressed me very much. 
um, when he was in the Iowa State Senate, he proposed, I believe he proposed, or at least he voted, he voted in support of legislation to designate land in Tama County that members of the Sac and Fox tribe, the Mottmiskwaki, could actually buy and live there and settle there. He was doing this in, in, to make it possible legally for these Native Americans to live freely and own land, land in Iowa. I, I thought that that spoke very highly of J.B. Grinnell. Did that, did that answer your question? Yes, Dave, I, I think it did. Um, and Krista uh, is, is representing the Stanley Center for Peace and Security. So we're excited to, to have her um, That's great. working with us. Yep. Yeah. And we, we are working together with the Community Foundation to bring several authors to our community uh, as well. Um, so Jason Reynolds uh, will be here um, virtually in, in April, um, giving a presentation to the school and then to the community. So wow, lots of great things happening in Muscatine. And, and on yeah. behalf of our community, I, I really want to thank you for honoring us with your presentation on Alexander Clark Day. Uh, it was a great pleasure to have you here. And um, I, I also want to uh, mention that we had a student delegation uh, go to Grinnell not too long uh, before COVID. And yeah. it was a group of English language learners who oh, performed wow. a, 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 a play that they had written um, and they were coached by Mary Swander, the former uh, poet laureate of Iowa. Oh, wow. Uh, in their work. So, so oh. about a dozen of us had a chance to um, engage with the Grinnell uh, faculty and staff. Uh, oh. So it's just a, a, a wonderful way to remember uh, some of the wonderful things our students have done. Yeah. Oh, wow. What, what an event. Yes. Yeah. Wow. So uh, your presentation was recorded and we will share that on our public access TV station right. for, other to, for others to view. And Dave, thank you so much uh, for presenting your, your knowledge of this really important part of our history in Iowa to us. Thank you, this was an honor. I, I appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. And thank you uh, for everyone joining us tonight and uh, good night.